Because by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out from the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is strong. Cause you're alive What a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive What a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out We're alive Cause you're alive Your love is greater Your love is strong Me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Welcome, everyone, and it's good to have you here. Some of us, of course, virtually, and others of us on site. But let's begin our Lord's Day by just thanking Him for the fact that we can gather in two different ways. Father, we thank You this morning. And God, we know as we gather, some joining us virtually, some here with us, uh, it is not the most desirable of circumstances, and yet your provision is felt and tangible, God. On top of not only the abilities that we have to worship together in spirit and truth, we also know we have your Holy Spirit that is those gathered here physically with us, are unified by that same Spirit. Those who are joining us virtually, that same Holy Spirit unites us and binds us together as family in you. You, you are with us. You are in us. And so together we just ask that you would be with us in a way that helps us to grow together as well as individually, helps us to praise you with full heart individually, but knowing it's with the corporate church together. And God, honestly, not just refuge, but we know that today many millions lift up your voice, your name in praise. And so we thank you they can offer you song, 
We thank You that we can sift Your Scriptures and let it have its way with us. Help us to learn from our brothers and sisters in the first century as we continue in the book of Acts. And God, help us to remember and think through all of the ways we can be thinking about the acts that You have for us in the week to come and how we can live them in a way that and walk in them in a way that glorifies You and lifts up and magnifies Your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to everyone, and of course, if you are joining us for the first time, I'm James, pastor at Refuge Church, and for those who are here with us, of course, we have a little info card we'd love to have you fill out and put in the offering. Uh, for those who are virtually, we'd love to at least have you say hello in the live chat, just so we know you are, you're there, you're not a number, you're a name, and you know, you could email info at findrefuge.com and just say, hey, I, I was here with you virtually today, I just wanted to let you know who I am, and and ask for prayer. You can prayer requests, how to connect with us during the week, fire away all those questions that you want. Uh, those who fill out the cards and comments and prayer requests and put them in the offering bucket in the back of the service that are here with us today. We certainly love to go through and see all of those and hopefully engage in some mutual encouragement. We, we have some great, man, I, I am so shocked and surprised. One of our uh, one of our members got great news. Uh, Doug Weaver, we thought he was going to be one of our first congregants who sort of faces job loss with the economy, kind of the first economic casualty within our congregation in a significant way. And God be praised, he found out that he is uh, being kept by Boeing, and so they're keeping him on another position. Things are looking pretty exciting about that. So we, we have praises in our congregation. We also have some prayer requests I'll mention in a minute, but another praise that we have is, of course, you know the Weavers. Uh, Doug's wife, Lori, usually oversees the fireworks stand that we do, and found out finally kind of what the, the reap and reward of all that sowing our volunteers did by hosting a fireworks stand this year. And it, it turns out that as a church, that fundraiser alone and that week brought in, I think it's somewhere, it's $19,000 at 400, basically just shy of $20,000. And so we want to thank all of them. We want to just lift up, everybody at home even, just clap your hands and like lift them up in a wonderful thank you. Uh, so many good volunteers, so much of a, a, a big part of helpful uh, budget for us as we want to improve the facility and of course, we've had some curveballs this year, so it's great to have that cushion and those extra funds. And our giving, honestly, has been consistent and generous as well. So we're celebrating this week, and of course, it, the security we have is in Christ, but as He provides just blessings and means and resources now, we want to be good stewards of those. Uh, for those who are going to give online if our offering today or are going to give in the bucket in the back, we want to lift up our offerings in prayer, thank God for them, ask Him to help us steward them. Uh, but we also want to lift up a couple other members of our congregation, a couple other households, just so you know. Uh, we have a couple members dealing with uh, illness or hospital, and, and right now our, our brother Mark Ancio is, is really sick and could use a lot of your prayers. So we're going to lift him up in prayer today, Brother Mark. And also uh, Keith Findling, many of you know he's had surgery on his leg and we're, we're hoping that his recovery, it seems to be going well. The surgery went better than, uh, and to, than, better than feared. And so we want to lift up those two in prayer this morning and thank God for the offerings and the means he gives us to care for one another and our community. So let's do that now. God, we thank you. God, that we can gather as your church that through generous hearts we're able to love one another, uh, celebrate the way that you provide for us, provide jobs for us, God, we provide opportunities for us to raise funds that can be used for your purposes. So we thank you for the Weaver household today, uh, both Doug's joy and Lori's hard work and all the blessings that they have helped us with through the years as a church. And God, we help, hope that all offerings given today in sacrificial and cheerful ways by our congregants can be put to great use by our deacons, by our consistory as we chart the course for refuge and and lead. And, and God, we do lift up then as, as your elders and our praying congregants, we want to lift up Mark, we want to lift up Keith to you today, and their families, and their friends. God, that you would comfort them, allow them to comfort Keith, allow them to be a blessing to Mark. God, we just lift up and ask for healing for them. We ask for it to be swift and miraculous, that your spirit would be with them, that physically you would protect them that you would touch their bodies and you would heal them, and that we could celebrate again all of the ways that you are at work in the midst of our congregation. So we thank you for all these things in your name. Amen. 
Well, a couple more things, if those of you who have a bulletin here with us can actually pull it out and look on site. It's right in the bulletin with your sermon notes. And those who are at home, this is actually on findrefuge.com. It's right there, uh, the first blog, you can check it out there. Just some extra things that are going on during the week. August is a great time to jump in with us on some of our midweek activity. Just a couple things to note. We've got our women's devotion and prayer. That's still in its fledgling uh, venture on Monday nights. We also have our, our guys meeting in, on Monday, mo- uh, sorry, Tuesday morning, and we're going to be starting a new series called Christian Basics, where we use Zoom, watch a little short video, and have some discussions about the basic building blocks of a Christian and the Christian life. And then on our happy hour, we're going to start Revelation. We're actually going to go through, ooh, that, the book that uh, is always kind of fascinating to study. We're going to go through that as well. So we're just beginning those this week, so feel free to jump in and join us. Uh, But for those who want maybe an easy entry point, we are going to be having on Thursday nights here in August coming up a three-week study. Normally during the summer, we've done an outdoor patio study. Of course, getting together is kind of difficult, but we would love to get as much of the congregation together virtually as possible on Thursday nights coming up in August. So stay tuned. It's going to be on the topic of covenant. We talked about God's covenant with us a lot in the book of Malachi, which we just recently wrapped up. And so we want to talk about being a covenant community together for a few weeks via Zoom. So maybe that's just a good sample. If you haven't been plugged into anything regular or weekly, you could join in and become a part of that with us on Thursday nights in August. So stay tuned for more detail on that, and we'll get you that online on our Facebook page and the website if you're with us virtually. For those of you here, you can see there's email contact and different things you can take home with you right now. So we've got some other stuff to take care of, some great time with our Belgic Confession and an acapella hymn, and then we'll be diving into Acts 14. So let's move on with our service this morning. depths or climb the heights my lord remains with me before the blood ran in these veins the days ordained for me were written in your book O lord before i came to be anxious thought and lead me onward evermore to tread the path I ought how blessed am I so bound with love surrounded yet so free in doubt or blessing life or death my Lord remains with Well, today we'll be in Acts chapter 14, but before we get there, I wanted to go back to the 90s, 1990s. 
and talk about a little show I used to watch. Some of you might be familiar with uh, comedian and talk show host. He's still around, uh, but he started in the 90s <clears throat> on a show called Late Night with Conan O'Brien. I thought he was particularly funny. He actually worked on The Simpsons as well. He was a writer. And then he actually uh, was on Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And he actually, some of you might remember there was a whole fiasco where they moved into The Tonight Show, but there was a bunch of politics. Things kind of fell apart. Uh, now he's on TNT and things are still going strong. But something you might not know about Conan O'Brien, in, in the 1990s, there was a little known case of mistaken identity. And, and, and maybe I overspeak here, but, but take a look at this. People, people used to say that uh, someone you know used to look a little like Conan O'Brien. There we go. So you can, you can decide for yourself, but in the 1990s, people used to say, and that, that actually might not even be recognizable for some of you that that's me. The hair kind of messes that up. Uh, people used to look at me and say, you look like Conan O'Brien, which I kind of found flattering at first and then kind of funny and then kind of annoying, you know. Right? But w one time I was literally stopped by, on the street, by, by some Asian tourists who wanted my picture. And, and to be fair, I really don't think that they thought it was really that I was him, but they wanted to take it and see if they could fool their friends back home. Uh, so this was, you know, I, I had to deal with, you look like Conan O'Brien. I would have maybe rather had people tell me I look like Conan the Barbarian, uh, but I don't quite have the physique for that. But, but let's be clear, people may have mistaken me at one point in my life for an Irish talk show host, but... But no one ever mistook James for a Greek god. All right? that, and that actually happens today in the book of Acts. And, and in addition to mistaken identity, uh, we have attempted murder, we have some miracles and more. Uh, Paul and Barnabas have gone off on a missionary journey. And, and it, they're technically both second gen, right? I mean, they're second generation. The disciples in the upper room have gone out. They're preaching the gospel. Uh, the twelve apostles have been at work. Herod has had... Uh, James, the disciple, killed. Peter got arrested a couple weeks ago. We, we read about that. Peter left Jerusalem and left Jesus' brother James uh, to take point in Jerusalem. And then Saul, who we know is also called Paul, who was persecuting Christians, he's, he's been transformed from someone totally anti-Christianity to now one of the most ardent defenders of the faith and, and writer of a bunch of our books of the Bible. So, we see the church, church in Acts, like many religions, uh, sometimes called mystery religions of the first century, uh, a lot of them, obviously, right? We don't have a lot of those mystery religions 2,000 years later. The church in Acts could have, like many of those, just kind of been going, going, gone. But instead, 13 chapters into the book of Acts, we see that Christianity and the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going, growing strong. And so I'll pray, and we will dive into Acts 14 in this exciting chapter in the life of our very real and historical church. So God, thank you that we can take a moment to reflect on your story. Not just story, but the narrative you've crafted with the, the warp and woof of our universe, of our planet, of our lives, of the story of humanity. Just a chapter in your ongoing story and, and a chapter where you've shown us fall and then redemption through Jesus. And now, God, we look forward to that restoration. And we look forward with the same assurance that these disciples had in the first century as they so passionately moved for the work of your good news. And so help us to catch their heart, catch that spark and that fire so that 2,000 years later, we would carry that same flag, we would be waving that same banner, we would have the same fervency of faith that we see in these men of faith and women in your Scripture. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Chapter 14 begins, verse 1, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned the minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, some sided with the apostles. 
when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now, at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out to the crowd crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, He allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet, He did not leave Himself without witness. For He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders... For them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. And God's people said, Amen. Well, I like to call this section uh, Poison Pedestals and Perseverance. And I love the fact that it begins, right? Right out of the gate, a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. And we've talked about this as we see the gospel expanding in Acts. We'll talk about it a little more as we get to the next chapters 15, 16, 17. But the cool thing is, as we see right here, is that the good news of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, it's breaking through national and ethnic and cultural boundaries, including one's former religion. Right? And, and of course, Scripture here uses it just as Jews and Gentiles. Obviously, most of us, we like, well, there's more than two sets of people in the world, right? Well, a good way of understanding it as we read the Scriptures, Jews meant descendants of Abraham, also the nation of Israel. And, and of course, they also had, they had a rich cultural heritage. They had feasts and festivals and practices and cultural mores prescribed not just by men, like Moses, but by God Himself. And obviously, they had also had specific and exclusive worship of, of the one true God. So Gentiles is just the blanket term for everybody else, right? Everybody else. No matter what their national, ethnic, cultural background is, it was just everyone. So, I mean, within Gentiles, you have Greeks and Egyptians and all the other nations, all, all sorts of different melanin levels in their skin, right? And a diversity of religion as well. And so all these boundaries, the Gospel just spills over and incarnates and brings together. And Jesus is saving people from every nation and every tribe and every tongue. And in many aspects, it breaks through and it, it makes a bridge. It, it bridges the gap, right, between all of these things. But there's one aspect. Right? The Gentile doesn't have to become a Jew to become a follower of Jesus. 
or a believer of the one true God, or a recipient of salvation by grace alone. But there's one thing it breaks and it doesn't bridge. And that, that's religion, right? That's why it's, it breaks through national, ethnic, cultural, former. Because once you become a follower of Jesus, like, other worship has to fall away. We can keep a lot of our cultural aspects or even our national identity or, of course, our ethnicity, right? Like those things, gospel wraps up all those things in a big embrace. But the former worship has to go away. That, that's broken. That's gone. That's dead. Now we worship the one true God together. So all, all these other aspects as the gospel spills around the world, there's multiple aspects that can be received or redeemed. Right? One's language isn't sinful. One's nation, ethnic, cultural distinctives, practices, dress, a lot of those things, provided they don't go against anything declared as sin in Scripture. But, Religion is you can't be Hindu and worship the true Jesus. Right? You can't be you can't be a Jew that rejects the revealed Messiah and yet share in the inheritance promised by the God of Israel. Right? It, and so we have to understand like it breaks through all these things and wraps them all up, but there is exclusivity in the gospel. Our our former worship goes away, as we'll see in a minute, right? You can't worship Zeus or Hermes or or guys that you think are Zeus or Hermes, right? It doesn't matter. And so here's the even more sad thing that is obvious here we see also. It's sad and we have to notice those that come in to poison the minds of the people that have just received the good news of Jesus are the people who think they're God's people. They think they're the good people, right? The unbelieving Jews, right? They don't believe, reject Jesus. They think they're with the one true God and yet they're rejecting His promised Savior in the Incarnation they stir up and poison their minds. Right? And it says, Paul and Barnabas remained a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of His grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people were divided. Right? We're always going to see division. This is always going to happen. Right? Some side with the Jews and some with the apostles. And so the thing to celebrate here is that the gospel crosses and bridges so many other things, but the thing to soberly assess is that it is not all-inclusive in every way. False worship has to go away. You can't have Jesus as part of your pantheon. When it comes to your religion, it isn't a call, it isn't just a call to come as you are, but to come as you are and leave some things behind. And Paul even says, we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Vain things who made heaven and earth and the sea, all that's in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. Well, more on that later. So then an, an attempt is made to mistreat and to kill Paul and Barnabas. They, they leave and they flee. But where do they go? They just go and they continue to preach the gospel, right? Good on them. But I want to pause here for a minute because it's an important application and reflection for us to think. Is what poison is being poured into our ears today? What poison is being poured into our ears by unbelievers to keep us from the truth? Right? right like Hamlet's father sleeping, having in the garden poison poured in his ears. What, what are we letting poison us? Because trust me, guys, this doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen all at once. It gets slipped to us in what we're being fed. And I'm speaking metaphorically about being fed. Right? Poison gets slipped into what is being fed to us, metaphorically. It's what is being poured into our ears while we, while we are metaphorically asleep. Not really asleep, but asleep at the wheel. Now, there's at least five kinds of poison, or at least we'll get to a few here, and we'll have a fill in the blank, we'll just leave one for you. But there's at least five kinds of poison just looking out at the landscape of all culture today, and we could come up with a lot longer list if we wanted to spend an hour or a whole conference talking about it, right? But one is very obvious, is the idea today that there is no the truth. There is no the truth. There's just your truth and my truth. 
Who's to say? I mean, this is my heart truth. It's what I believe, right? No, it, truth is no longer based on, I, I can no longer say, well, I base my truth on facts and reason. Well, that, that's discriminatory. It's a tool of the dominant culture now, apparently. What about felt truth? What about what's true to me? Right? This, this moves all the way then into some identity politics, right? My self-identity is truth. Or at least is my truth, and no one else can say anything else about it. Whatever I identify as, that's reality. Well, then whatever I worship, that's God to me. Like, it just removes any sort of objective understanding of the world or the God who made it. We have humanism. Right? Just this idea like, Everything that we're doing is because we treat humanity as if it is the highest thing, the highest good, the highest authority. Whatever our felt group evolving convictions are about, about what is good or what is bad or, or what is nice or what is unkind. Our felt convictions, our aspirations. I, it was R.C. Sproul even referred to it once. We, we have statistical morality. Well, you know, this we see that human condition involves a whole bunch of people who do this. So that means it can't really be something that's bad. So now we have to consider it normative. No, that, that's poisoning our minds against the truth. Materialism works the same way, whether it's atheist, whether it's humanism or materialism. An atheist mindset Right? This is all there is, right? This tangible world is all there is. All that I concern myself with as I walk through my day or my week or my year or my life. Life must be lived to the fullest now. Nothing should be restrained or deferred or given up or sacrificed because this is what is to be lived. Pursue happiness only in terms of this life. There's no transcendent virtues or eternal happiness, so... So your compass then heading for the pursuit of happiness, right? It's going to be totally different. It's just going to be based on material things and materialism. And now, fill in the blank. Maybe even just, just keep drawing lines. Maybe there's some that you know, honestly, kind of infects your daily rhythm or your daily walk or your friend or people in your family. What is, what is it that you need to be praying against and filtering and asking the Spirit to help you against the poison that pours in to your mind and your ears. It could be a false religion. It could even be just the vaguing of Christianity down to just a moral, kind of therapeutic, deist God, right? Well, there's a God, but He's just a big booster. He tells me to feel good about myself. He's my therapist. He's my Santa Claus. He exists to give me, to give me gifts and blessings. I just need to be kind of vaguely good. What are the poisons in our ears? Because they're there. And we're being bombarded with them. And we don't always have a Paul or Barnabas. And we're not always listening to the Holy Spirit that's saying, no, 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 no. That tastes good on the tongue right now, but that's poison. No, don't quit drinking that. It's going to pull you further and further away to different tastes you don't need. It's going to lead you down a subtle path to where you're, then you're so far off Because what all this really ends up being is just a form of self-worship. Self-worship is more prevalent than worshiping God today. Even if sometimes we might say we worship a God, we've made Him in our image, so it really is just self-worship. So there could be maybe no better place to camp and contemplate with your week. What poison is being poured into people's ears as you look around culture right now today? And what about yours? What about your own mind? Because right? the poison isn't just distracting, it's attacking. It's, it's the, what the Jews here are doing, right? Paul is wrong. Barnabas is deceiving you. They're saying all oh, your worship is in vain? Oh, that's mean. That's judgmental. That's, they, they, boy, they're being really harsh and exclusive. And where's their room for questioning and mystery, right? See, some of the poison is just drip, drip, dripping in our ears. And it's, maybe it's not a direct attack. It's subtle. Oh, they shouldn't say that. That's mean. Just love them. Don't tell them there's a God that judges them. Don't tell them that there's an eternal damnation. Just love them. What a fallacy that is, right? They're going to walk off an eternal cliff, but you just, just pat them on the back and tell them they're all good. 
Right? What poison gets into your living water system and starts polluting your mind? How is the poison of the world getting into your life or your witness? And are you drinking? Be honest with yourself. Are you drinking something you shouldn't? You know, just has a little poison in it, but you kind of like the taste. Because Paul is not unclear. Again, right? He, all other worship and religion is clearly denounced as vain. I love that word, vain. Paul's not unclear. We bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Turn from something vain to something real, living. The one who made heaven, earth, the sea, all that's in it. Vain, if you look up in, in the Greek word, actually it means something that is unreal or ineffectual or unproductive or practically godless. So what is he saying here? Paul's actually, he's referencing that they're trying to worship him like Zeus. He's, he's looking at them, he's like, they worship Zeus, they worship Hermes, they worship Apollo, all these other things, right? What's he saying about Zeus? He's saying he's unreal. He's unreal. Worshiping Zeus and Apollo are in vain, because, or Hermes or whomever, or any of that, the Greek gods, right? They're, and he's actually saying, they're, by using that word vain, they're godless. Literally, they are not gods. Let's talk about Zeus for a minute. Some of you might know, not, not know your Greek mythology. But Zeus, how does he stack up against the God of the Bible? Well, he doesn't even come close, right? Zeus, you know, we, we think of Zeus as like the God of gods. Well, one thing, you just read the Greek understanding of Zeus. He didn't always exist. He was the son of a titan. A titans existed before the gods. Some of you have seen Clash of the Titans. You know, whatever. Cronus the titan sired a bunch of children. Rhea, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, and Hades, and Poseidon. But he swallowed them as soon as they were born because he learned from Gaia, you know, Mother Earth, and Uranus that he was destined to be overthrown by his offspring. So he decided to just, as soon as, somebody, as, soon as they, they were born, he ate them. Zeus overthrew Cronus because Gaia, they, they, they tricked him. Zeus was born and you know, scuttled away and was able to be raised. And so then Zeus overthrows Cronus, forces him to puke out his siblings. And then Zeus shared the world. He wasn't in charge of the whole world. He shared the world with his elder brothers, Poseidon and Hades. Zeus got the sky and the air. Right? Poseidon got the water. Hades got the world and uh, the... Uh, the world of the dead, the underworld. Nobody actually got the earth because Gaia could not be claimed. See, the problem we have here, it, we have a God who is created clearly by the accounts of their own beliefs. And created by a dad so dumb he's tricked by Mother Earth. And then Zeus shares authority with the Lord of the underworld. That would be like, God doesn't share authority with Satan. In fact, Satan doesn't control the underworld. Zeus didn't even control the sea. And boy, look into this guy's list of infidelities. Wikipedia has like 47 different women. I'm not even sure they're all women. Right? His, his fornications are the stuff of legend. The wiki of all his lovers, it's crazy. He has, he has kids, he fights with his kids, he's petty, he's pretty pathetic. The list of problems goes on and on. Bottom line, Zeus was created, not eternal. Both in reality and mythology, right? Zeus was created. He's a fiction. But even in his fiction, which some people worshipped as reality, he was a created God. He wasn't omnipotent. He wasn't all-powerful. He wasn't eternal. He was born. He he was created. He's a fiction. He, he literally is the flying spaghetti monster of atheism, right? Or he's like Thor, whatever. He's got 99 problems, but a god ain't one. He's not a god. The Greek gods, they're just mythical figures like Batman, Superman. Greek superheroes and inspirational stories. And that's why they've faded. Why has the God of the Bible stood the test of time? Because he's in one sense unfathomable and mysterious, but also, he stood up to philosophical scrutiny for thousands and thousands of years by some of the sharpest minds of every generation. So, here's a, little, here's, a little, here's a little tip. Next time someone tries to be dismissive 
and say, oh, every generation and culture has its own gods, and they're all basically the same. No, they're not. No, they're not. That's poison poured in the ears. It's another vague mistruth that we start to actually kind of feel like maybe has some substance. You can literally bullet point out the vast, massive, crazy differences between Zeus and Yahweh, or between Apollo and Jesus, between Jehovah and all other gods. They're all fictions, but, but that's the point, isn't it? Right? People would rather worship created things or ultimately themselves because it, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier because you can then make up the rules of engagement. You can see it. You can appease it. You can, you can wrap your mind around it. It's quicker. It's easier. It's digestible. Honestly, like, we're like Cronus, the Titan. We want our gods... We, we want to have our gods, but we want to be the titan that swallows them and keeps them under our control. But I got them right here. They make me feel good. They're right here in my stomach. They, they won't have any power over me, but I, I like that you know, I have them. And now, before we're too harsh on the folks in this story who then think our disciples are gods, um, let's deal with that case of mistaken identity, Right? So I just, you know, like, because they show up, and like me showing up in town and people thinking I'm Conan O'Brien, right, they show up, some miracles happen because God is great, they're preaching the gospel, so, man, they, they, they heal a guy, his, his feet don't work, it, it also mentions, it doesn't list out all the signs and wonders, but it says God's doing some amazing things, so they have a case of mistaken identity that happens here. Well, before we, let, let's explain why that could have happened a little bit, because I want to go back and look at a guy named Ovid, give you a quick history lesson. Publius Ovidius Naso, he lived from about 43 before Christ, B.C., until about 17 or 18 uh, A.D. So he, he was born, he was, you know, lived well before Jesus, and then he would have, he would have died before the time we're in. Now we're in, you know, now we're in the 40s. And he wrote a book called The Metamorphosis, a 15-book continuous mythological narrative that remains one of the most important sources of classical mythology even to this day. It, if I'm feeling generous, I'd say he's kind of like the J.R.R. Tolkien of his time, or, or maybe actually more, he was like the J.K. Rowling of his time, right? But he wrote this book called The Metamorphosis, 15 books with over 250 myths. And so right around the time, you know, just... Several you know, years before Paul and Barnabas, this story, which is right there in the Metamorphosis, would have been floating around in the public consciousness. There's actually a story where Zeus, in the guise of a mortal, came with Atlas' grandson, either Mercury or Hermes, and they came to a city. They went to a thousand homes, all of which were inhospitable to them, but one house received them a humble house indeed, thatched with straw and reeds from the marsh, pious old Baucis and Philemon of equal age were wed in that cottage of their youth. So the two gods come in. They don't recognize them as gods. They're just, they think they're being hospitable. They had very little to offer. She actually takes like thatch out of the roof to help light the fire. And then she takes down... If she, they proceed to then prepare the best meal they possibly can, but it's still so meager. And then something amazing happens. Right? Their, their mixing bowl, as often as it was drained, kept filling up of its own accord. And the same thing, their, their jug of wine kept filling up of its own accord. And they saw this strange sight, so the signs and wonders are happening. And they, so they utter a prayer and they're trembling. And then they, they, they finally, of course... Zeus and his companion, Hermes or whomever, finally tells them, they, they own up. They're like, we're gods, and this wicked neighborhood's going to be punished because no one was hospitable to them. So they actually go out of town with this couple, this aged couple. They destroy the entire city. They turn their meager little house into a huge temple and then grant them a boon. And they actually ask, you know, there's a sweet part to this story. The, the couple actually asks, they, they love each other so much, they, they, they don't want to die one before the other, so they ask that they, when their time comes, they just pass together. It's just kind of romantic. So you think about it, like this story is a popular story in the public consciousness. Zeus and Apollo showing up. 
Some amazing miracles are, take place. People treat them real nice. They get blessed. It's kind of sweet. And now Paul and Barnabas come to town. A couple seeming mortals, signs and wonders. Which, I th- their minds are playing that game of what if. Right? What if. I used to play this when I was a kid too. I loved my own mythologies, right? I loved Transformers. And there was a little part of me that thought, you know, maybe one day I'll see a car turn into a robot and I'll be like, no, this, it's actually all real. And so what happens is these guys, they've heard the stories by Ovid. They know their, their mythology, but yet they do actually believe in these gods. And now these mortals show up, two guys. One's, one's a good speaker. One's, you know, maybe has a bigger beard. And so like, what, wait, what if this is Zeus in disguise? And that must be his buddy, uh, okay, it's one of his kids. What if? Let's worship them. Maybe we get blessed like those two people in the story. Right? When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices. The gods have come to us in the likeness of men. That must be Zeus. That must be Hermes. Let's get the priests down here. Let's get oxen and garlands. Let's get sacrifices. And, and Paul, Paul yeah, God bless him, he tries to head this off at the pass, right? And it says, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. They're tearing their garments. They're just like, no, do not do this. And I want us to actually realize what's happening here in human history as well, which I think is another great stake in the claim that this is a true and real faith that we live. Right? There's a stark contrast between claiming to be God and strongly denying it. We'll actually look at three situations here. This is the best contrast of all, right? Jesus claimed to be God. Now, here Paul and Barnabas have their chance to jump on that train, and they don't do it. Right? Instead, it's vehemently denied. Men, don't do this. We are men of like nature with you. Now, we, we bring you good news, but it's that you should turn from all these vain things, turn from all these myths, There is a real God. He made heaven and earth. It's bigger than Zeus. You've been walking in your own ways, and yet he even points out that this same God has given you a common grace. You've got rain for your fields and crops. You had fruitful seasons. Like this God has been good to you even when he didn't have to. You need to turn to him. But what they do, they nowhere do they claim to be God and get on the cool train of like these guys, they could have been worshipped. They could have had oxen. They could have had, they probably, these guys, they could have milked that for quite a long time. And anybody of anybody, guys, if any of you guys know your Ghostbusters, right, they're breaking the cardinal rule here. Right? Modern comedy would tell us, you know, Ray, when someone asks if you're a god, you say yes. Right? That, that's, that's comedy gold. That's comedy standard. Like you could, you could milk that train. But you know, it's only been a couple of chapters since someone didn't denounce proclamations of godhood. Some of you remember Herod in chapter 12. On the appointed day, Herod put on royal robes and the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. And Herod was like, bring it on. And he struck dead. Now I don't think Paul and Barnabas, they're not thinking about Herod and like, whoa, 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 we don't want to get struck dead. They're not acting out of fear. That's doubtful here. They weren't afraid of being Herod 2.0. But they clearly, don't sh- they, they clearly say, don't worship me. Worship the one true God. So notice that contrast. Jesus claimed to be God. That's what Paul and Barnabas are preaching. So if this was just a first century power grab, if these were just guys milking a mystery religion, looking to set themselves up and prop themselves up as people, why not take this deal? They probably could have milked a whole deal here, been set up, lived well, been treated like gods, literally. Right? Now, I'm sure a skeptic could have said, I'm sure even today, a modern skeptic could look back and just think, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Christianity. Paul and Barnabas are going around. They probably set up that guy with the allegedly feet that didn't work. They could, have, they could have set up their healings. They could have been fake. The signs and wonders could have been magic tricks. Guys, if that's all it was, if they didn't really believe Jesus rose from the dead, if they didn't really have 
God-given miracles that happened not by their power, but by a power that wasn't theirs. Right? What's the difference here? If these were just men looking to make much of themselves, they should have taken this deal. But instead, they defer all glory here. They could have milked this. But they know they are not tricking the people into worshiping them. They know it's not about them. They know it's not about their prosperity or their wealth. or their, like They're not the prosperity preacher that we might worry about today. They have, there's, there's no skin in the game here for them except for the fact that they really believe and saw the resurrected Christ. There's no skin in the game except that the Holy Spirit is working through things through them of their own accord. And these are, these are first century believers, right? They were in the same generation as the guy who claimed to be God, Jesus. Right? This isn't a distant religious idea from something a couple thousand years ago. This is something tangible in the same generation. It could be disputed or refuted. And there's not a lot of incentives for Paul and Barnabas to keep doing this, right? Because when they actually stick to their guns and preach what they clearly believe is absolutely the truth, does it get them wealth? Does it get them a private jet? Does it get them prosperity? No. They stone Paul and drag him out of the city. He looks dead. That's the reward. That's the earthly reward we see. Turns down being treated like a god and gets beaten with rocks. When the disciples gathered around him, though, fortunately, he rose. It doesn't say anything miraculous happened here. It's not painted as something that he wasn't dead and rose again. It just seems like they thought he was dead. He must have just, he was beat up pretty bad and looked looked dead. They gather around him. He rose up and re enters the city. And he's right back at it, right? They really believed. That's, That's the point you need to understand. They believed Jesus' claim. And they denied having anything in and of themselves. They really believed. Paul isn't just believing a good-sounding morality. He claimed to have literally met Jesus on the road to Damascus, knocked off his donkey blind, right? His faith changed. He, he had no reason to do this turnaround. All he gets is hardship in this life. If he didn't believe this, he believed this. It, it's absurd otherwise. And likewise, Jesus really proclaimed and believed and professed to be God incarnate. God the Son, sent by God the Father. The question is, do we believe it? Do we believe it? I pray we all do. I pray that we can look at the growth, the crazy growth, and surprising, miraculous spread that has gone on now for over 2,000 years of what is not a big, heroic, Greek-style mythology, but a humble story about a carpenter Humble story about a carpenter who never travels more than about 60 miles from his place, never writes anything down, and yet has transformed the landscape of the entire world. There's something miraculous about this. And that's why as Christians, we we live in a certain way in light of that, in light of that reality. And I want to close with this because then we see, after all this hardship and preaching and mistaken identity and attempted murder, we see the disciples... They, they, they get back together and we see some things that naturally happen as Christians and as part of Jesus' church. We see some basic functions of a church leader's ministry and I think really just the Christian life in general if we look at it. Right? And we should expect today to see the same kinds of tangibles. If we profess the same belief of Apollo and Barnabas and all of the other disciples that sort of gather around them and commend them and, and get together with them and learn from them, we, we should see... Our money where our mouth is too, right? We should hope to see leaders and just Christians in general going through some of the basics described here in the life and the leaders of the church. And so we see that in verse 21. It said, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, right? That's an essential part of being Christians together. Obviously not all of us. Certain people have gifts of teaching and preaching, but preaching should be a part Gathering and hearing preaching, participating. Some of us learning and being preachers, right? Preaching is a vital part that will always be a part of Refuge Church, always be a part of Jesus Church. They're preaching in verse 21. And what does it say they do? They return and they strengthen the souls of the disciples. 
Right? As Christians, our goal, the Word should be being preached, but there should be a relationship happening, right? Strengthening one another. Encouraging one another. These are the things that we should be doing together. And then we also see strengthening the souls, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. That's the one that isn't sexy, right? Be like, hey, follow Jesus, everything will be golden. No, wait. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encourage them to continue in their faith. Why do they need that encouragement? Because through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Uh Uh-oh. We see Paul and Barnabas face some of those, right? Not all of us are going to get hit with rocks. I was just, I was just uh, visiting ICommitToPray.com this week, part of the Voice of the Martyrs, and there's actually there's a woman literally just this last week in India stoned to near death by a couple women in her community trying to get rid of that Christian problem. They're ruining the religious atmosphere of their neighborhood. They picked up rocks and threw them at her so, and kept hitting her with them until she was able to get away. Beaten so badly. Long recovery time. Not unlike, as this still does happen. So I encouraged us a few weeks ago to be looking around beyond our you know, CNN and Fox News, like actually looking to the life of the church and praying for those who still are living lives where they get persecution like Paul. Where just for saying that they're a Christian or for sharing with their neighbor, they get beaten with rocks to near death. And we do need to caution with good teaching around that then. We we don't promise your best life now in a temporal, health and wealth kind of sense. We do say best life now, but that best life may mean Insult for the gospel, persecution for the gospel, hardship for the gospel, more toil than others because you're trying to toil and be a witness to the good news in the way that you conduct and comport, the way that you handle your workplace, your home life, trying to teach and instruct your kids in the ways. So we need to caution there's good teaching to be had and there's probably hardship to be had on this road as a follower of Jesus. We then see that they're appointing elders. So we also see organization, right? Identifying leaders and and creating a system. And that's why we as a church have a consistory, right? There's preaching, strengthening and encouraging, cautioning people about what the Christian life will really be like, asking people to count the cost, and then organizing as a church to handle that together. We don't have to sit there and struggle through all of the costs as individuals floating out there. It was just me and Jesus. No, we're meant to be a community together organized. And then it closes in when they had appointed elders with prayer and fasting. They committed in the Lord, right? They're, they're practicing the spiritual disciplines. Right again, it's it's not just I got Jesus, so I got a good feeling in my heart, and now I just tiptoe through the roses for the rest of life. Like, there's discipline, there's prayer, fasting. When we look through our scriptures, we also see there's study, there's learning to there's developing and acquiring a taste for God's word. And then of course we see that the, it keep, continues on. When they'd spoken the word, they went down, from there they sailed. It actually says that they were gathering. When they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done for them. Amen? And that's what we're doing today. All right, we get to gather together and declare His good news and lift up the great things He's doing in our congregation. Lift up ways He's had some of our servants uh, fundraise and help support this church. Lift up and thank God for those He's healed that were sick. Lift up in prayer and, and declare that we love them and want them to be healed in Jesus' name. Like, We gather and declare the good things that God has done and the things we're hopeful to see Him do. Like This is the life of the church. And I love it. It says, and they remained no little time with the disciples. Right? They liked to be together. That's my hope for us too. It's my hope for the church as we continue to struggle through things like 2020's innumerable hardships. Right? That we could be practicing and gathering and declaring and or keeping organized keeping up with our preaching of the Word, strengthening and encouraging one another. That's 
You know, preaching can come from more of the pulpit, more from the pastor. The other pieces, you notice, are being done together. And so I, I, my hope and prayer is that as we continue through Acts, as I, for the rest of the day, as we move through the Acts this year, we'll keep learning from the church, being either reminded or refreshed or just set up with a good list. What, how do we make sure we're being God's people together, healthy and faithful, persistent, through the persecution that may be coming. So I, always then in light of the fact that, you know what? We're not struggling to accomplish the ultimate work. That's already been accomplished. That's what Paul's professing. He's like, and that, that promised Messiah, you Jews, He was revealed. It was Jesus. He accomplished grace, the unmerited favor of God. Salvation is available through Him, not by our works. And then he's looking out at the Gentiles. He's like, guys, you have all sorts of wacky myths about Zeus and all these vain things and all these these things where God's... God isn't petty. God isn't fragmented and fighting against Himself with siblings and brothers. And He's he's a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. But they're always in harmony. And they have harmoniously put together a plan of grace and restoration Through the cross of Christ, we can be reconciled back into relationship with the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and us. So, I hope that we can look to Paul with some excitement. None of us yearn for those persecutions. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We don't don't go hunting and seeking for martyrdom. But we strengthen and equip one another knowing those days could come, whether it's just the verbal insults or the loss of a relationship or maybe some actual physical persecution. We don't know. But we know that in Jesus, victory has already been secured. Our health and wealth are secured. And those things are eternal no matter what this life brings. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, I thank You for Your grace in all these things. Thank You for the way that You ministered through Paul and Barnabas. The way that we can look and realize that, God, the other vain things in our life can fall away. God, strip away the things that poison the minds of my brothers and sisters in this room. The the little drops of deception. The little cultural distillation that works its way into what We're being fed through stimuli. God, help by Your Spirit. Help us weed that out. Help us to see that. Set it aside before we drink it or filter it out by calling out to You in the midst of our confusion. God, help us to see clearly who You are. Help us to not worship created things. Help us not to put Paul's and Barnabas's up on pedestals or pastors or James's or anyone. God, don't let us mistake other things as to be worshipped or venerated or focused on to the distraction from You. And God, thank You that we can have a community where we can strengthen one another in understanding that, growing in it, focusing on it, leaning into it. I pray that we would be encouraged even in a season and in a year where so many seem discouraged And may that strengthening and encouragement be the marked difference by which some see us as your followers and turn and follow you in your name. Amen. Sure.